Good afternoon, uh, good evening, and welcome wherever you're joining us from. Those here who are here uh, at the uh, School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and those who are joining us online, welcome. You are here to attend the 32nd Annual Mortensen Distinguished Lecture, and this particular lecture is, uh, takes place every year. And before we get started with the lecture, I'd like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Muskutin, Odawa, Salk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a member of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I take the responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of this possession that have allowed for the growth of this institution. I'm Clara Chu, and I'm the director of the Mortensen Center for International Library Programs here at the University of Illinois Library at Urbana-Champaign. And this annual uh, Mortensen Distinguished Lecture is organized by the Mortensen Center. And this center was uh, endowed by Walter C. and Gerda B. Mortensen. And it's been established since 1991. So we are uh, just over 30 years strong with a mission to bring together and strengthen international ties among libraries and librarians worldwide for the promotion of international education, understanding, and peace. And so this particular event uh, is part of a celebration for Libraries for Peace Day, which is an observation with the International Day of Peace uh, that is a uh, international celebration by the United Nations. And we celebrate with the world community we also celebrate locally with Champaign County uh, because this event is also part of Welcoming Week, a week-long celebration of immigration that brings together neighbors from all backgrounds to build strong connections and affirm the importance of welcoming inclusive spaces. And this particular year, the International Day of Peace is focused on ending racism, building peace. As part of the work of the University Y, it has a new American Welcome Center. And we wanted to highlight this work because it's a place where it's working towards community so all immigrants can thrive and flourish. And the work that is done here locally is able to address various areas. And these areas of work include immigrant helpline, families and youth, outreach and education, small business support, capacity building, et cetera. And we have uh, Melissa Houston, who is here and has information for those of you who might want to learn more and support the work that is done at the center. Also, although uh, the Mortensen Center is organizing this work, it won't be possible without the co-sponsorship of various organizations. And these include the Center for Global Studies through the support from the US Department of Education's Title VI NRC program the European Union Center, the Department of Journalism, the Mortensen Center, of course, the School of Information Sciences, and the University of Illinois Library at Urbana-Champaign. And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Melita Garza. Melita Garza is an American journalism historian who studies news as an agent of democracy, examining the press's role in building civic agendas, including those that have perpetuated systemic injustices. Dr. Garza, the Tom and June Netzel Sleeman Scholar in Business Journalism at the Illinois College of Media, is the author of the award-winning They Came to Toil, Newspaper Representations of Mexicans and Immigrants in the Great Depression, published by the University of Texas Press in 2018. The book, They Came to Toil, examines English and Spanish language news coverage of immigrants during the nation's longest economic downturn. Her work has been published in Journalism History, American Journalism, Journalism and Communication Monographs, and the Howard Journal of Communications. She earned a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2012 after two decades reporting for the Chicago Tribune, Bloomberg News, and the Los Angeles Times. She also holds an MBA from the University of Chicago and a BA from Harvard University. 
Dr. Garza teaches business journalism, uh, history, and journalism ethics and diversity. Welcome, Dr. Garza. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you today and to welcome our esteemed guest speaker, Mike Thompson. Um, I think it's important to note that not only is Mike Thompson the 32nd speaker in the series, he was also our 30th speaker in, during the COVID pandemic. So we're welcome and thank you for being here in person this time. So, um, so without further ado, Mike Thompson is a multi-award winning international correspondent for the BBC and his work has taken him to many troubled places around the world from continents in Middle East, Africa, and Asia. He's covered conflicts such as um, found in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He's been to uh, cover devastating uh, events such as the uh, Haiti earthquake, uh, and some might say um, the devastating event of some US presidential elections as well. Um, he's covered the fall of Gaddafi and the death of Nelson Mandela. So. Um, needless to say, he's many awards, and some of these are the Radio Story of the Year for um, his book, Serious Secret Library, and I highly recommend it, so um, please read it. That was the subject of his 30th um, appearance, th uh, appearance at the 30th lecture here. Um, also, he is, was News Journalist of the Year in 2012 and has won uh, the Sony Radio Academy Awards and Work Correspondent of the Year. And, um, I think we will not have time to hear him speak if I continue with this page long list. Um, so I think um, in addition to Serious Secret Library, I would like you to also note he is the editor of the Raqqa Diaries, Escape from Islamic State. And um, this latter book is about a young man's day to day experience of living under the terrifying Islamic State group. And I think, um, of course, um, he is based in London where he lives with Jane, who is also here, and uh, also has a very illustrious career. And um, so thank you. Here you go, Mike. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and it's great to be all to, with you all here in person after the pandemic, of course, it wreaked such havoc with all our schedules and appearances. Um, and especially in this amazing center of learning here in Champaign-Urbana. Um, much journalism around the world uh, focuses on talking to or talking about political, military and other leaders, film, pop and sports stars and all kinds of celebrities. Yet rarely the comparatively powerless people who have little or no voice in the world. And this is particularly the case for those in developing countries where democracy is either fragile or non-existent, along with the rule of law, decent education, and any real say in what their leaders do. Enabling such people, often plagued by war and tyranny, to tell their stories, giving voice to the voiceless, empowers us all. Not only is being heard cathartic for those who've lost so much, it also helps us to truly engage with their plight. And while we may all be told that hundreds of thousands of people in faraway places are being butchered or oppressed, that's often not enough in itself. We need to feel, to identify, to think that this could be us or our brother, sister, mother, father. And when that moment happens, differences of country, creed or culture melt away as we connect with a thread of humanity that connects us all. And thankfully, these epiphany moments when broadcast on TV or, or radio are no longer limited to those who see or hear a particular broadcast at a particular time. Now, thanks to big advances in digital technology, such precious, often unretrievable voices are no longer lost to the past. Instead, they live on online and in numerous digitized archives around the globe. And archives are something that this great institution here in Champaign has in glorious abundance. Now today I'd like to mine my own extensive archives to bring you the voices of some of those often unknown and previously unheard voices that inspired and moved me, along with countless BBC listeners and viewers. Voices 
that live on in my head and in so many others. Now, I'd like to start by taking you to Ethiopia in East Africa, where in 2002, a worsening drought was threatening the lives of countless people across this parched and poverty-stricken country. Things were so bad that it was feared the drought could be even worse than the one there in 1984 to 85 that led to the deaths of more than a million people. Despite this, the outside world seemed oblivious to the scale of the crisis and appeared to be doing next to nothing to help. I travelled to the country, determined to highlight this impending disaster, having been told that there was still time to prevent it, if help could be generated quickly. It was while covering the crisis that I came across someone whose voice was to help save hundreds of thousands of lives. Yet this wasn't the Prime Minister, the head of the UN, or other VIPs I, in I interviewed. It was Feo Hadji, who was just eight years old, the son of peasant farmers, who in the ordinary course of events would have been unseen and unheard. Here is a short extract from my report around 200 kilometres south of the capital Addis Ababa, when I came to meet young Fayo. Sitting on a rusty can a few yards away, an eight-year-old boy is drawing shapes in the dust with a small stone. A fly settles just under his left eye, but Fayo Haji seems resigned to its presence, just like he is to the hunger that gnaws at his stomach. I know I'm going to die, and so are my brothers and sisters, because we are all so hungry. My brothers and sisters just stay in our home now. Do you really think you're going to die? Eh. Yes. What have your parents told you to make you feel better? They have told me that our cattle have died, our crops have failed, and they have nothing to give me. Don't you have any hope that food will arrive? No. I would prefer to die rather than keeping waiting for food. I prefer to die. Now, Fayo was the same age at that time uh, as my son, uh, nine years old, and his desperate words saying that he'd preferred to die than wait any longer for food aid to arrive deeply shocked and moved me. And to be honest, I felt ashamed that I belonged to a world where a young child had to make a choice of that kind. On being sent an advanced copy of my report, the former rock star Bob Geldof, who had years earlier organised the world-famous Music Appeals Festivals, Live Aid and Band Aid, um, after the Ethiopian famine, returned to campaigning, quoting young Fayo's words, and around $800 million worth of food aid from around the world poured in, and the looming catastrophe was largely avoided. The following year, I returned to Ethiopia to see if I could find the boy whose anguished and brave words had helped save so many. Had he survived? After several days of searching without success in the area that I'd met him in, I'd started to write an account of how he appeared to have died. Then a press officer from the UN who was travelling with me nudged my arm saying, Mike, Mike, look, look. I turned to see young Fayo jumping up and down outside the window of our SUV which was crawling along the deeply potholed terrain. I hadn't found him. He had found me sitting on a rust. After a very joyous reunion, Fayo took me back to his village to meet his family. They all began thanking me for generating the help that saved them all. But I pointed out that the person they should be thanking was the small, wiry boy in front of them, their own son. It was his words, not mine, that inspired the world to act. Now, I'd like to go on now to uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, a nation whose recent troubles have seemed as big as this vast West African country, the size of Western Europe. To give you some idea of its plight, more people died in Congo's last wars than all the soldiers killed in World War II. Yet despite this fact, and the ongoing bloodshed that continues to stalk this nation, we in the West rarely give it a mention. Now, it was there in the east of this violence-plagued state that I met a young woman called Zuwadi Mongane. 
in a hospital for the victims of sexual violence. People in the area's thick forests are preyed upon by numerous armed militia groups, and that was the same when I did this report as it continues to be now. Uh, the, the group was one of the most notorious, and it was known locally as the Interwahamwe, and you will hear that word mentioned by the interviewee Zawadi in just a minute. Now, I must warn you that some of what you're about to hear contains descriptions of appalling violence, so please do be ready for that. This is the Wadi story. I come from the village of Ninza, and there's a lot of insecurity in my village, so we prefer not to spend the night in our homes because we're scared in case the Interahamwe comes. So at night we go into the forest and we sleep there. But my problem started when one night we went to sleep in the forest and the Interahamwe attacked us. And there were 50 of us, and they took us away. Who were the people that they took with you into the forest? 25 were members of my own family. Of that whole group of the 50, I'm the only person who has escaped. What happened when the rebel soldiers, the into a Hamwe, got you to their base in the forest? The Interahamwe said that anyone related to the chief of our group had to stand up. So about 20 people stood up and the Interahamwe killed them right there in front of us. They had bayonets and they pushed the bayonets through the sides, through the ribs of the people. What happened to you then? After they killed the members of my family, 19 members of the Interahamwe raped me, and then they killed two of my children in front of me, and then they took the baby off my back, and they tied a rope around its neck, and they forced me to pull the rope and kill my own baby. I was with my brother and my sister-in-law. They cut off the hands of my sister-in-law and they tried to force my brother to rape me. My brother said, you're my sister, I cannot rape you. If I rape you, I'll die. And if I don't rape you, they'll kill me. So I prefer that they kill me. So the Interahamwe cut his head off. What did they do next? In the end, only three of us were left alive out of the 50 who were captured. And the Interahamwe told the three of us to go and start digging in the soil because we were going to grow cabbages. And we were digging, and then another militia group from Rwanda came, and they said to our captors, what are you doing with this filth? Why haven't you just killed them? Why are you still holding them? And the Interahamwe who held us said, oh, don't worry, they're digging their own graves now. You finally managed to escape. How did you do that? Two of the new group of Interahamwe who had come across us took us to go and fetch water. But I was in such a bad state that I could barely walk, so I lagged behind the group. And one of these new guys from the Interahamwe, he said to me, even if I let you go now, well, you're in such a pathetic state, you'll never survive. You'll die anyway. So why don't you take that path over there? If you follow the stream all the way, you might get somewhere. So I took that path and I carried on walking, but I could hardly walk and I had cuts all over my feet and legs. And at one point I was so exhausted that I just had to collapse. When I woke up in the morning by the river, I saw a young boy of about 15 years old fetching water. So I showed myself, and at first he was very scared and he wanted to run away. And also he was ashamed for me because I was completely naked. 
For the four months that the Interahamwe Amway had held me, they kept me naked. I didn't have any clothes. And I said, no, please take me. So he took me to his village, even though I was naked. And from afar, we could see the men of the village cutting wood. And the boy, he gave me something to cover myself up with. And then the men made a sort of stretcher from the wood. And they put me on the stretcher and they carried me to another village. You've said that the rebels killed your children, killed members of your family. Do you have anyone left? I had four children and now I have one. One of my children survived because he wasn't captured that day because he was staying with a friend of mine. He wasn't with us. So now I have him and I also have one of my brother's children. If these men are ever caught, what would you like to happen to them? Because I'm a Christian woman, I can't meet evil with evil. But the only thing that I can ask you for is to make these Interahamwe go back to Rwanda. Even if I stay alone in my own village, at least I'm with my Congolese brothers and sisters, and I know that people will look after me. But please, I'm asking everyone to send the Interahamwe back to Rwanda. Now, um, during that interview, the woman here, Zawadi, became so upset at times she was breaking down in tears uh, and a colleague of mine was also finding it very difficult who was translating uh, to continue. Um, and I asked the doctor concerned, would he ask her in Swahili if she would like to stop this interview because it was all too much for her? And she started banging the table and saying, no, no, I want to be heard. This is what happened to me. I want people to know. And she said, you said earlier you wouldn't use my name or photograph. You use this this face, you use my name. Uh, they're not going to make me invisible after all they've done to my family. Now, following the broadcast, the BBC's flagship Today programme got what its then editor described as one of the show's biggest responses in its 50 year history. Money, envelopes filled with cash rolled in, some without even the name of the people who generously sent it. So many people wanted to help, many of whom said they'd never thought about the Congo and its troubles before. Now, one of these was a Norwegian jazz musician who went on to compose this anti-war music. Luca Vesseltoff, based here in the US, was so touched by Zawadi's gentle voice, with its lack of hatred and bitterness despite all she'd been through, that he dedicated this track called Why to her on his then latest album. Now, if you listen carefully, you can hear underneath the music the Swahili words from the interview behind that music. <laughs> Of course, no broadcast can ever stop a war by itself, but the kind and astonishing reaction from the international community following Zawadi's words greatly helped her recovery. Just take a look at this photo taken just a few years later. Since my first interview with Zawadi, the one you just heard, I went back to see her over each of the next few years and charted her progress, which was significant. With help from the outside world, enhanced by her own extraordinary courage and resilience, she went from strength to strength and is now happily remarried and living away from the conflict-plagued 
eastern part of Congo in the far south of the country. And her words have inspired so many, and I most definitely include myself in that. Whenever I can, I do my best to travel to the countries where I'm reporting. Not only does this give me more information and the ability to confirm the validity of people's accounts, it also makes a huge difference interviewing somebody face to face, as against over a phone line or on social media, to establish the trust of an interviewee, especially one in a traumatic situation. This is enormously important. But sometimes, travelling to the place in question is simply too dangerous. The town of Raqqa in Syria was a case in point. I wanted to get some understanding that I could broadcast to the world of what everyday life was like there under the brutal rule of the Islamic State group, otherwise known as ISIL, ISIS, IS, or locally as Daesh. This incredibly cruel militia group, who between 2013 and 2017 controlled vast swathes of Syria and Iraq, made Raqqa their so-called caliphate, capital. While we often heard in news reports at the time about frontline battles with the group, little was known in any detail about what it was like living under their yoke, sometimes for years. And I wanted some of those in this terrible position to be given a voice so that they'd know that their trauma hadn't been forgotten and that the outside world did care. After several months spent winning the confidence of a small activist group there, I finally managed to do a radio interview over social media with an amazingly brave young man in the city who called himself Sama, not, of course, his real name for obvious reasons. Anyone caught by ISIS having talked to a Western journalist faced death by beheading. His shocking accounts of daily life in what was arguably the most frightened and isolated city on earth had a huge impact on BBC listeners and others around the world. But soon after this, Samba told me that it was becoming too dangerous to do any more radio interviews, because to do them, he had to set up some improvised satellite equipment, which took time to both assemble and take down. ISIS, who he said had heard about his BBC interview with me, were going door to door looking for the person responsible, so he could be caught red-handed at any time. Plus, if you were ever found to have received a call on your cell phone from a London number, that in itself would be enough to condemn you. So to help get around the problem, he began writing daily accounts of his life on his cell phone before sending them to a friend in Turkey via WhatsApp, which is of course encrypted. Having a Turkish number discovered on your phone by IS was not a problem as many Syrians have relatives there. His friend then sent these accounts to me in London. I had his accounts voiced up by a Syrian colleague at the BBC, and these were then illustrated by a talented young British artist called Scott Coelho. They were later broadcast in five episodes across BBC television, radio and online. And I'd like, you to, play, I'd like to play you now the first one of the resulting five-part series. Here it is. It's Friday. This is the day we used to gather in the street after prayers and have long chats, but not anymore. Anyone gathering in public without permission now risks being accused of plotting against Daesh. I'm passing a crowd in a public square. I don't want to join them because they may have been told to watch a beheading, but thank God it's only a lashing this time. The offender is one of theirs. His offense, I'm told, was carrying out a homosexual act. Tomorrow I go back to work, a new week, with new hopes of being liberated. But I want to tell you about when Islamic State first entered my beloved city. On Mother's Day, a cold winter morning, I heard the sounds of warplanes. I immediately set out for my home. My brothers and sisters and I had planned a small party. As my taxi neared, clouds of smoke filled the air. The regime's warplanes had hit our street. There were ambulances everywhere. People were running around carrying the dead and the injured. One of my neighbors told me that my parents were hurt and had been taken to the general hospital. When we arrived there, the smell of blood and death filled the place. They asked us to look at the bodies laid out in front of us. 
to see if my parents were amongst them. There was my dad. His body was covered in sharpened wounds. Your mother is being treated in there, a voice said quietly, but don't go in yet. Two hours passed, finally a doctor came out. I told him that I was her eldest son. I've managed to save her life, but she's very ill, he said. A neighbor of ours, who runs a fruit and vegetables shop, offered to help. From now on, he said, you can work for me. I accepted unconditionally. A few weeks later, I was working in the shop when I heard gunfire and the boom of heavy weapons outside. Everyone was running on the street. My friend gripped my arm and said, Daesh had taken over the city. Soon after that, a man I'd never seen before shouted at me. Hey, you, smoking is not allowed. Another cried, Hey, you, why is your wife not wearing a veil? This is forbidden. I heard loudspeakers in the streets saying some people were about to be executed. A group of blindfolded young men stood in handcuffs. In front of them, a masked man began reading. Hassan, fighting with regime forces. His punishment, beheading. Isa was a media activist, accused of speaking to foreign parties. His punishment, beheading. A man with a sword carried out the punishment. As I walked down the road, cursing out loud, a group of Daesh's religious police rushed over and grabbed me. They took me to their headquarters. I tried to reason with them, but it was no use. You were cursing out loud. Your punishment is 40 lashes. I learned from Samar's diaries that uh, the most absurd punishments were carried out against people, uh, in addition to the ones you've just heard about, including one man who was given 50 lashes for apparently having trousers that were too long. They should apparently, according to uh, ISIS, be above the ankle. It gives you an idea of the absurdity as well as the brutality. Now that series, helped by the terrific animation, sparked a big response with many young people saying they'd become engaged in the plight of Syrians in Raqqa and elsewhere for the first time. And Samer, you'll be pleased to hear, uh, did finally manage to escape from Raqqa, and his full story is in the book I compiled from all this in his diaries, from his diaries, sorry. Now, there's a photo of this here. The Raqqa diaries escaped from Islamic State. Now, in some cases, groups of people become voiceless not because they've been forgotten as such, but more because they've been deliberately ignored, taught from birth to be neither seen nor heard. Which brings me to the manual scavengers of India, people who manually collect human waste from outside latrines in towns and villages where there's no proper sewage system and carry it, sometimes for miles, to dump sites. Most, if not all, are Dalits, members of India's lowest, most discriminated against group in the country's caste system. Uh, they do a filthy, horrible, yet vital job that nobody else wants to do, which serves the community they live in, yet they are almost completely ostracised. Manual scavengers and even their young children live like lepers, shunned by all. It's almost as though people consider them inhuman, with no thoughts, opinions or emotions worth hearing. The work of manual scavengers was banned by the Indian government many years ago, but demand remains, as does this kind of the kind of excruciating poverty that forces many people, virtually all women, to do the job. I travelled to a rural area of Bihar state in northern India to meet mother of seven, Lakshmi Devi, who's been doing this appalling job all her adult life. And here's an extract from my report for BBC National and International Radio. Two women of about 40 years old are stopping at each house they come to and collecting human waste from trays beneath hole-in-the-ground toilets. Now the taller one, Lakshmi, carries the contents and they're visibly dripping down onto her purple sari. The smell is hideous and I'm several yards away. I first started doing this work with my mother when I was 20 years old. It was terrible. I wasn't sure that I could carry on doing it. 
It was so disgusting, such a dirty, horrible job. I soon learned that the only way to do it was to hold my breath for as long as possible. The worst thing is that the baskets we carry the waste in often leak and drips down over your clothes. The first time this happened, I thought I was going to be sick. But my mother told me this is the only way we can earn money for the family. So I carried on. Do any of your children do this job? All my seven children are boys and they have found work clearing out sewage tanks so they don't do this job. It's usually women's work in our society. If I had a daughter, I would rather that we all die of hunger than allow her to do the work I do. I would rather that my children did anything but this, anything at all. How are you treated when you go out into the village nearby? How are you treated by other people because of your job? Does it make a difference? Oh yes, when people see me in the street, they cover their nose and say, there goes a manual scavenger. It makes me feel so embarrassed and ashamed. Sometimes I get so desperate, I ask God, why was I born into this community, destined for a job like this? I pray that my children don't end up like me and are treated more like human beings. When you go shopping in the market, how do the traders treat you? Do they serve you normally? No, not at all. Traders don't let me near the food they sell. I'm not even allowed to touch the vegetables. They say that people like me will pollute their vegetables and nobody else will buy their stock if we are seen handling anything. I have to point to what I want and they'll put it on the ground for me and leave me to pick it up from there. I turn to God and ask him how it can be that I'm considered so foul that people pour water over the ground I've walked on to clean it. I ask him this often. Does it affect the way people treat your children? Because of the caste I'm born into and the work I do, the parents of other children are told not even to touch my sons. They tell them that if they touch them by accident, they should immediately wash to purify themselves. Whenever they tell me this has happened, I long to do other work, anything but this. How does this affect your children? How do they cope with that? My children come home and ask me, Mother, why do you do this work? Look how it affects us. They often cry and feel very unhappy. But I tell them that I'm doing this because it's the only way to get food for them. I had wondered whether airing a topic like this on the BBC's flagship breakfast programme might be a massive switch-off for listeners, um, having them choking, so to speak, on their cornflakes. But um, I needn't have worry because Lakshmi's story, though grim in the extreme, touched many people. Uh, letters asking how they could help her and others uh, saying, calling on British politicians to put pressure on India's government to help people like her came flooding in. And when I told Lakshmi about all this, she was stunned, amazed and heartened that anyone, especially people from rich Western countries, were at all interested, never mind moved by what she had to say. Now onto a group of long marginalised people who've been described as the most persecuted on earth. I'm talking about the Rohingyas, predominantly Muslim people who've lived in Rakhine State in Western Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. It's a name that I'm sure most people here will have heard of, that's the Rohingya, due to the terrible things that have happened to them over the last decade. But when I first looked into their plight, way back in 2006, most people I knew had little idea who they were. They commonly say things like, the Rohingya what? Yet their very name was soon to become synonymous globally with words like genocide, massacres and mass graves. I couldn't believe it when I was told by Rohingya people back then that they couldn't marry, travel or have children without government permission. Many were evicted from their homes by the Burmese military and then forced to work as slave, slaves on the very land stolen from them. Even back then, many had fled the country to neighbouring Bangladesh, living more than a dozen to a room in shantytown slums or improvised camps. Although many Rohingyas had lived in mainly Buddhist Myanmar for centuries, because of their Muslim faith and Bangladeshi ancestry, most Burmese people view them as illegal immigrants, 
hence their lack of rights and an almost universal persecution of them. Just like India's manual scavengers, nobody wants to hear their side of the story. They just want them to leave the country. With tensions against the Rohingyas growing, I returned to Myanmar in 2010. I planned to travel to their home state of Rakhine to see what was happening there and had pre-arranged to meet various activists and community leaders. But before going, I interviewed two Rohingya men who had agreed to come to my hotel in Yangon, formerly known as Rangoon, to tell me about life in their homeland. And I'd like to play you an excerpt of that now. Towering above me here in central Rangoon is one of several mosques in the city, and you can probably hear the call to prayer now. And from where I'm standing, the skyline is punctured by a Christian church, and even closer at hand, the country's only synagogue. Now, all this would suggest that this predominantly Buddhist country is tolerant and at ease with other faiths and races. While this may be broadly true, there's one big exception. The Muslim Rohingya people, who face an almost unimaginable level of prejudice and persecution here. One day they came up with an order for us to move away from our village. And they built a military base in the village that we left. And we have to come up with our own kettles to plow the lands with forced labor in the very farmland that we owned. Throughout this interview, Siraj, which is not his real name, looks nervous. He says prejudice against Rohingya people like himself is less severe in Rangoon than in his home state of Rakhine in the west of the country. But nonetheless, he fears that by talking to me, there could be reprisals against his family. Next to him sits 58-year-old Atu, again not his real name. <laughs> I was born in Rakhine State, and my father served as the head of the village for 30 years. His father before him was the village head for 35 years. But they don't recognize me or my children as citizens of this country. Atu goes on to tell me that, like other Rohingyas, his daughters had to seek permission to get married or face up to five years in jail and are forbidden by local authorities from having more than two children. When my daughters applied for permission to get married, the form they had to sign clearly stated that they would be charged in court if they have more than two children. They were made to sign those papers. What will happen to your daughters if they do have more than two children, both to her and to those children? No one dares to have more than two children. If this does happen, people find ways to stop the baby being born. Most people solve the problem by taking pills. Well, to see for myself the worst abuses Rohingya people are facing, I'd arranged to travel to Sitwe, capital of their home state of Rakhine, or Arakan, to meet two families there. But on calling to check that all was OK for my visit, I got this response. The condition of Sitwe is not good. People in Sitwe, those I organized uh, to meet you, they are afraid to meet you because uh, they are very afraid of the government. They're afraid? Yeah, people are afraid. Back at my hotel, Siraj becomes tearful as he talks about how his children, who like him were all born in Burma, and face a future of state-backed prejudice. And he's not surprised that Rohingya people in Sitwe are too frightened to talk to me and is now wondering whether he should have done either. When we entered this hotel, I could spot some intelligence people. They could also spot at us. And I could read their eyes. And if they want to, they can simply ask this hotel to give them this CCTV record of our presence. If this happened in Yangon, you can simply imagine how even worse happened in Sitwe. And two weeks after my aborted trip to Sitwe, violence exploded there. 
after some Rohingya men were accused of the rape and murder of a Buddhist woman. An orgy of looting and burning of Rohingya homes followed and many were put in internment camps. In 2015, the violence against them became even worse, with tens of thousands forced to flee the country. And by 2017, around half of Myanmar's one and a half million Rohingyas had fled. Rohingya people are, of course, only one group of humanity that have been forced to become refugees. In their case, due to rampant and extremely violent persecution. Others around the war world have fled wars, such as 13 million Syrians, that's half the country's pre-war population, now refugees inside their countries or beyond its borders. Ukrainians have become the latest example of this, following Russia's invasion of their country. Others still, faced with a lifetime of abject and hopeless poverty, have fled in search of a better life for themselves and their children. A few years ago, I was called by a Ugandan priest who told me that the man you can see in this photograph had been kidnapped and was now being tortured by his kidnappers. Philemon Sumeri is a refugee from Eritrea, a grim, impoverished dictatorship in the Horn of Africa where military service for young men can last for a decade or more if they survive that long. He'd been captured by his kidnappers while trying to cross from Sudan into Egypt. Every day, they would torture Philemon and other captives held with him, and then they'd telephone his family back home, demanding money. The idea was that his screams of agony would compel his distraught, desperately poor family to give all they had left to free him. The kidnappers had taken Philemon to their base in North Sinai, a troubled, virtually lawless area of Egypt that borders the Gaza Strip. It's now home to many Islamist extremists and various kinds of criminals. Despite many months of talking to the kidnappers by text and phone, the priest I mentioned earlier felt his efforts weren't helping at all. So he asked, could I cover the story? His hope was that publicity from this might help force the Egyptian government to rescue him and others kidnapped with him. I agreed and asked what more he could tell me about the kidnapped gang. Amongst the information he gave me was the kidnapper's phone number, which he'd used when trying to mediate with them. I decided to give them a call. Over the following, following days, I must have rung the number dozens of times without any answer. But finally, I got through. Hello. Hello. Who are you? I'm calling from the BBC, the BBC in London. I'm asking to speak to Philemon. Philemon? Yes. Okay, I am sick to Philemon to discuss with you and speak with you, okay? Hello, hello. Hello? Is that hello, Philemon? Uh, yeah, I'm Philemon. I understand that you uh, have been kidnapped and are being held hostage. Uh, they will be dead to me. If you, if you have some money, please share to me. Like, how much money are they demanding from your family? $25,000 lift. $25,000. $25,000 lift. That is a lot of money. Yeah, it's, it's more money. Yeah. Please help me now. Yeah. And when are they saying this money must be paid? In five days. Five days. What will happen to you if there is no money? If if not money, they will be de they will be dead to me. They will kill always, you. Always cut your hands, cut your uh, foot, cut your uh, fingers. What, what conditions are you in, Philemon? Condition is bad. It's bad life. Have no enough food, have no enough water. Alloys heat by sticks and burning by fire in the electric city. You've been electrocuted and, and burnt by fire and beaten? Yeah, my body is burning, all of burning. How long have you been held? Four months. Four months. And how many other people are being held with you? Forty boys and two girls. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a leader of this uh, guys or uh, film on or this home. Okay. If you don't give any money, I w- must kill Philemon here with uh, five days. His chance is five days. But how can you do this? This is this is barbaric. No, I am doing anything. You pay twenty-five thousand dollars, eh? But you haven't any money. I will kill to fill money here. Have you killed other people who could not pay? Ah, you are die here. I'm killing you. I haven't, I, you haven't any money. You are to die in Sina. How many people have you killed this way? It is a lot of people I'm killed here. This is my work. I am, it's your work? I am lived by this work. But this is not work. This is murder. That is by force. I am taken from Rashida Baibani $25,000. When you have paid to the money, Philman is dying here in Sina. Hello, hello, Mike. I am Philman. Please help me now. My life is not... Please help me, the Mike. Please, <laughs> give me now, please. I'm in a smiley. They will be killed to me. Please help me, please, Mike. It took much uh, deliberation by the BBC's editorial policy unit before that interview was allowed to be aired. I mean, for instance, uh, might we be giving kidnappers the air of publicity, helping them to advertise their awful demands. It was a point. Uh, Finally, though, because I had constantly challenged the kidnappers during the interview, uh, that concern was set aside. But was it just too gruesome to broadcast? I argue that because this is what is happening to so many refugees, people should know. Finally, it was broadcast, but that wasn't the end of the story. Just as I had the kidnappers' number, They, too, had mine. For weeks after the broadcast, they called me at all times of the day and night. Sometimes I'd be watching TV with my family, at others at a dinner party or kissing my children goodnight. I'd answer my phone to hear the screams of poor Philemon, desperately pleading with me to help him. Pay the money, $20,000, the kidnapper would then shout, if you want his screaming to stop. In the end, I was beginning to feel I was nearing the edge and uh, always put in the hands of kidnapped specialists. But if that was bad for me, just imagine what it must have been like for the poor families of people like Philemon, hearing the screeching torment of their loved ones, followed by ransom demands that many simply can't pay. That experience finally led me to travel to North Sinai to discover the extent of the kidnap trade there. What, if anything, was being done to stop it. I discovered hospital mortuaries filled with the bodies of tortured refugees, as you can see there, many covered with torture scars after being dumped in the scorching desert. So that's all those who didn't pay. Many had, di- had, many had died without the world ever knowing who they were or how they suffered. I'd like to play you now a brief extract from my report when I travelled into North Sinai. driving through the barren and largely lawless region of northern Sinai in the direction of Egypt's border with Israel and Gaza. This is where the nightmare truly starts for the thousands of mainly Eritrean refugees who flee their country each year in search of a better life. Held hostage for weeks or even months, they're often tortured and beaten while kidnapped gangs try to extort ever-growing ransoms from their families. I've just arrived at the home of a local Bedouin leader who's at the heart of efforts to rescue kidnapped victims who've managed to escape the clutches of rogue members of his community. 
and I'm told that Sheikh Mohammed al Maniri has just rescued some hostages a short time ago and that they're inside his house now, being protected by members of his clan. So I'm going to go in now and see if I can talk to some of them. A young woman now has just lifted up the back of her top to reveal some really quite awful scarring all over her back. The kidnappers would make me lay on my back. Then they would get me to ring my family to ask them to pay the ransom they wanted. As soon as one of my parents answered the phone, the men would melt flaming plastic over my back and inner thighs, and I would scream and scream in pain. This, they hoped, would put extra pressure on my mother and father to find the money. As the noticeably frail and nervous-looking Lemlem tells me her story, a hand is placed gently on the by now tearful 17-year-old's shoulder. It belongs to her friend Zia, who was one of those held captive with her in a windowless basement room for nearly a year. They had about four or five of us tied up together, and they'd pour water on the floor and then they'd electrocute the water so all of us would get electrocuted at the same time. They would starve us, they would burn us, they wouldn't let us sleep. Nearly half of us died from the torture and from the starvation. When you were nearing the end of that year in horrendous conditions, were you starting to lose hope that you'd leave there alive? Because there was so much torture, death would have actually been a, a relief a lot of us were actually hoping for death because that would have been an escape for us from the torture. Uh, a little good news amongst all that. Um, Philemon did finally, uh, was finally freed. Um, a ransom was paid, some by his family, who were left completely impoverished. And he says now uh, they sold all they had, all their land, their house, and then now they have to work as laborers on the land which somebody else now owns. But at least he is now free and he survived. There does come a time, of course, when we're all voiceless, when we've passed away and become part of history, remembered, no doubt, by our families, but not necessarily the world at large. This can even be the case for people who've lived through extraordinary times. Their rich experiences of value to us all in danger of being lost. All of which brings me to a thought I had way back in 2005. At that time, there was just a handful of people left alive who had fought in the First World War, the war to end all wars that sadly didn't. Every one of them well over 100 years old. Among them, the inspiring Harry Patch, aged 111. It was clear that in a matter of months or even weeks, all these people could be gone. The horrors they'd witnessed so long ago and their thoughts about it, forgotten. All we'd have is second-hand accounts in history books. So I set out to interview as many of them as possible. Happily, they all agreed to speak to me and it was genuinely a real privilege to meet them. Their minds were sharp, their sense of humour still strong and their memories clear as a bell. Perhaps too clear in some cases, when it came to the carnage that had scarred their early lives so many decades ago, which tells you much about the terrible damage war does, internally as well as externally, and that time can't always heal. I'd like to play you now the final extract from a radio report which features two of those remarkable veterans, Fred Lloyd and Harry Patch. Both sadly died soon after the interviews they gave me. None of the veterans I met were keen to talk of the horrors that wiped out large swathes of their generation. But when they did, they didn't hold back. That was a terrible war. There was thousands of young boys killed for nothing. Fred Lloyd, who was 105 when I spoke to him, served with the Royal Veterinary Corps on the Western Front. We lost 49 boys that went to school with me. 49 we lost. Well, it didn't have to be killed. There's no need for wars. You can't have a young 
younger generation. They can't imagine what it was like. I went 80 years and I never spoke of the war war, not even to my wife. You can't describe it. Harry Patch, born in 1898, fought in the Battle of Passchendaele, in which 70,000 British soldiers died. Speaking to me aged 107, he described how meeting a German veteran of the same conflict brought home to him the absurdity of war. 87 years ago, we were foes. We would have shot each other. We shook hands. And we were friends, not enemies. As Harry Patch goes from this cathedral to his resting place today, we mark the end of an era. The last voice with direct experience of combat in the trenches has fallen silent. But the thoughts of 111-year-old Harry Patch were given new life by the band Radiohead, who, inspired by his words in that interview, put them to music. It wasn't worth it if two governments can't agree. Give them a rifle each and let them fight it out. Do you think the world learnt anything from the First World War? No. They never learned. Thank you all for listening and letting me be heard, along with all the voices I brought you today. Uh, you've helped every one of them uh, back to life, and it's been a, a real pleasure and a privilege talking to you all. And I hope that before I leave this remarkable institution that I'll have the chance to meet some of you personally. But uh, once more, thank you. Thank you, Mike and Jane, for that wonderful presentation and packaging of audio and video and, or um, photos. So I just had a couple of thoughts, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, I was struck by the beginning of Mike's talk when he spoke about um, bridging differences of country, creed, and culture. And I think we can see in his coverage that he's done that. And I think also his giving voice to the voiceless, he, and he does it in a way that reminds me very much of a, a, another journalist who operates in a different medium, um, in this case a, a photojournalist, a graduate of the University of Illinois, who um, left us in 2013. And I'm speaking here of uh, Wayne Miller, who was the um, member of Alfred Steichen's World War II Naval Photographic Unit, two-time Guggenheim winner, and, um, very, and involved in a, the largest photo exhibit of its kind called the Family of Man exhibit. And what, what uh, Wayne Miller said was, he said, once you can sensitize yourself to what is going around, on around you, so you are not trying to express yourself, but you are trying to express what the subject feels. Once you can really feel that, it's amazing what you can see. And I think it's so true in Mike's work because it's amazing what you can hear. And he does this in su such a way that he's not superimposing his own persona on the stories of the people, but it's the stories of the people that are coming through. 
Um, I think another thought I have here with respect to the differences Mike talks about bridging is this remarkable um, comparison with the uh, pioneering American journalist um, Robert C. Maynard, who the first African-American publisher of a major metropolitan newspaper, uh, the Oakland Tribune, neither of whom are with us anymore, neither the Tribune nor Mr. Maynard, but Mr. Maynard left us this legacy of the concept of fault lines, of crossing generation, class, gender, geography, and race and ethnicity. And I think, again, when you're thinking about giving voice to the voiceless, as Mike has exemplified in his work, um, it is in, incumbent on the journalist to, to bridge those divides, those things that are not part of his own or her own lived experience. Um, there's no other way to be so compelling in the storytelling. And the third point I'd like to make, and this is a very Western-centric observation again, but I think when we think about what is the meaning of journalism, the meaning of journalism is to give people the information that they need so that they can be free. Right, so that they can make decisions about their life. And we can't do that without journalists who are willing to go to the places that most of us can't go. And um, I think that's another contribution that I'm um, thrilled to see come through so clearly in Mike's work. So I guess my, my I will throw out the first question, then we'll open it out to questions. My first question, Mike, and this is something that I, um, work with my students on is how, what are your tips for helping journalists do that? To not superimpose their own persona, but to be able to tell the story of the other. Uh, well, I, th I think it's, um, it's one of those things that um, people very often, when they start in broadcast journalism, particularly, uh, they want to be able to um, uh, be recognized, be, be taken note of. So they very often will uh, insert themselves heavily into what they're doing uh, so that people will remember them, I suppose, and they make a mark. Um, and even some quite veteran presenters, one of which I can think of but won't name, who uh, was famous for, for, for questions that might last a minute or two before the person got a response. Occasionally that response was no, which, <laughs> which is always quite hilarious. Um, but I think it's always trying to think, what are you there for? You're not there... You're not the story. You're not there to tell people about you or even your reactions to the story. You're there to bring the story of the person you're talking to's uh, thoughts and, uh, uh, and uh, beliefs. And uh, that's a crucial difference. And I think that applies whether you're doing international journalism, journalism like me or whether you're, you're doing local or, or, or national. Um, you think you're there to, to ask the questions for people that are, are watching or listening that they would like answered and also to, get, to feel you're getting a feeling of the person you're talking to. And you give them the confidence to think, I want you to tell me your story. I'm not telling you how to tell it. I'm not taking a view on what you should say or what you shouldn't say. Uh, I just want you to, to tell us what you think and to try and make the people feel that what they're telling you is, val is valued, is, is worth saying. Because so many people who are used to being voiceless, they're convinced that why would anyone including uh, earlier on when I mentioned the manual scavenger in particular, um, Lakshmi. I mean, she, she, th she kept saying to me, but no one wants to hear what I've got to say, because there they don't. Uh, but I said, there are many people within your community who do want to hear what you've got to say, as well as many outside of it too, internationally. So I think that's the big thing I say. Just remember that you're there to, to bring the, 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 the thoughts and the people, the story uh, that, you're, that you're seeing to your audience. You're not there to bring yourself to the audience. Okay, thank you. Is there a question from the audience? We have a, we have a question. We have a question um, online um, from Ray James. And uh, Ray uh, asked this question, and I'm repeating it just for the, um, the tape recording. Are you ever brought to tears by the stories of people you interview? Uh, well, yeah, good question, yes. Um, because there are times when uh, I found myself really moved. I mean, uh, Zawadis was a case in point, the, w the woman in, in DR Congo. Uh, and Lakshmi, when I heard, when she talked about how um, her children were discriminated against, people wouldn't sit near them in a class, and how 
uh, the traders would throw food on the floor rather than hand it to her, and then people would splash the ground that she'd just walked on because it was filthy and contaminated. Uh, I think those sort of thoughts, and the look on her face when she was telling me that, because I could tell she hadn't often spoken of this, because if you live in that world, people know that, you don't say it, and outside the world, there, they don't want you to, to hear about it. But yes, it's, it's, you can't divorce yourself from the stories that you're covering and the people that are badly affected. And uh, like with the, the case of uh, the kidnapped Philemon, I mean, there I was getting these calls. And even before then, I was deeply distressed about the fact that I knew what was happening to him. And I'd been told, and I'd heard a guy telling me, you pay the money or he dies. And feeling, well, maybe there's something more I can do other than the usual as a journalist, which was uh, giving publicity to the, st to the story and hoping that the authorities concerned would act. Um, but then it came down to me thinking, no, I'm personally involved completely because they're asking me to pay and making me feel if I don't give that money, I'm responsible. Um, so, yes, it was a, it's a very good question, and it, it, it happens, and I'm sure I speak for many of my colleagues too on that. I'd like to follow up with a question uh, based off of that, which is, um, in addition to whether you've had any tears, I'd like to know about your fears and how you balance um, moral courage. As you know, the, the slain American journalist James Foley said, if I, if I don't have moral courage, we don't have journalism. So can you talk a little bit about, I mean, clearly you referenced many instances in which the people who spoke to you were risking quite a bit. Um, what did you risk and how did you temper risk with the virtue of providing the information? Well, um, I always try to, one, take appropriate steps like talking to the BBC has a high risk team and I talk to them about what I'm planning to do and they're ma mainly ex-military people and they would say whether they thought it was safe or not or ways that could make it safe or safer, it's never going to be totally safe. Um, one of the problems often is, though, that you can land up in situations that you never foresaw. That, you know, you, you like one case in, uh, again in Congo, where I'm following the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, uh, and I was doing a series called In the Wake of the LRA. Then I found I wasn't in the wake of, I was pretty much abreast with them. Uh, because I hadn't, I'd taken the word of an international aid agency that that they were very recently in that area, but they left. Then I find when I'm talking to the people, and these are, these are a group of people who, for those who don't know, who, uh, who've been running amok since uh, the 90s and mutilating their victims, uh, kidnapping children, just grotesque and moving people's noses and lips. and I mean, just really, really awful. I suppose a Christian group, amazingly. And a bit like you, are, you wonder with Islamist groups, where does Islam or Christianity feature in either of these cases? Uh, or these beliefs, but in that case I find myself in a village that was, um, when I talked to the people, they looked really worried, they're pleased to see me, and then they thought, well, what are you doing here? Uh, and after a conversation where they told me that they're having the LRA coming into their, their houses at night, and they can't go and get their crops because they're too afraid, and I said, well, where, where, are, where are the LRA, where are these, these militia? And they said, over there, behind those trees, that's, the, that's their line. Um, and cases like that where um, you find yourself in uh, terrible danger, and or, not just me, but others I was with, and um, facing a you know, potentially horrendous fate. And in that situation, I wouldn't have... If I'd known they were actually going to be surrounding that village, I would not have gone. Because um, you're always trying to have measured risks. Um, there's other cases where, if you're on the front line of a war zone, you can never tell where a shell's going to land, which of course anybody who, there may be people here in the audience who've been in the military and, and know, you know, fighting as soldiers and would know that. I mean, for a journalist too, you don't, you don't know, you're wandering the streets and you're, anyone now in the Middle East particularly, where I spent a lot of time, people see you as the target more than the soldiers because soldiers are guarding you, so they think VIP, target number one. Uh, and also they're aware of kidnapping. So I think I'd say you've got to have courage, but you've got to also think there's no point in dying for a story unnecessarily. Particularly if you die there, you won't bring the story back. It's completely pointless, apart from the damage it does to your family. So I would say, yes, I take a lot of risks uh, and have done regularly, but I try to keep them measured and never, you know, ridiculous. 
I want to butt in as, as Mike's wife and just confirm <laughs> that you are a terrible journalist if you can just ride this kind of stuff oblivious to the pain and suffering. Of course, to be good at his job, Mike is acutely sensitive and all these uh, traumas that he experiences, uh, he takes, he brings home to a certain extent in, in his body. And you know, he would wake in the middle of the night and rush to the toilet. And I think, oh no, he's having another Congo nightmare. Or we would be in the middle of supper and he'd break off. And it's a, a, a teacher who he has got to know who is trapped in a basement in the besieged city of Dere and doesn't think, thinks that, that this is the goodbye voicemail that she is, is leaving. So th there is a very human cost. And I think that those around Mike, uh, those who, who love him and know him, had to make the decision somewhere down the line that you, you can't stop him doing what he needs to do. It would be so much worse to keep him chained up on a comfy sofa watching episodes of The Simpsons. <laughs> yes, people have often asked me, what it's like for your family. And in fact, I had a, my oldest friend who I, I, I knew at school who one night after a couple of glasses of wine said to me, uh, you know, you're a real, um, you're really a selfish, very selfish person. And I said, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? <laughs> Why are you saying that? And he said, because you go off to these dangerous places. And if you're, if it's your, if you're, you enjoy thrill seeking, white knuckle rides, what about your family back home? What's going to happen to them? And uh, he later admitted to me that he, he could see a flaw to what he was saying. He said it was just in the mood he was in. Um, but it is obviously something that he, I think all people, all journalists who go to places we've, we've discussed. Um, and, and, and there's times when I've, when I've literally been in a situation, not only been, I've been arrested many times, I've also been in at times when I'm, I really don't, don't, well, I'm not sure, but I don't think I'm going to be coming out of a situation. I think it likely I won't. And it's those cases where, I, where you think to yourself, why did I do this, rather than feeling, oh, all journalism is worth it, you've got to, yeah, yes, you, you, you've got to take the risks, you've got to, you know, that's what gives the world journalism. I was thinking, what the hell was I doing? You know, and you'd give anything not to be there, but you can't help it, you're there. Can I add on that one, that um, I was um, reassured that once Mike thought he was safe out and out of danger so he took off the tag journalists in very difficult places have a kind of tag like you might tag a cat you know so you know where they are so if Mike was kidnapped they could trace him from a it would give a beep thinking that he was going home next day Mike took off his his ankle tag and wandered out into the streets and and accidentally photographed a secret installation and was being arrested and about to be bundled into the back of a unmarked van um, and in an altercation between his, his kidnappers, Mike's overriding thought was not, oh dear, I'm being kidnapped, but oh dear, how am I going to explain to my wife that I took the tag off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've um, taken, a, I've taken a, a photograph of the uh, Prime Minister of Lebanon's house, but I didn't know it was the Prime Minister of Lebanon's house. It just had this amazing sort of purpley light that was shining up one side, very pictorial. So I took this picture and immediately, and it was only in the end, I only got away because it's actually the security forces. And when this guy, this bull-headed looking uh, thug of a guy who was the one in charge turned up, these other soldiers had been holding me there and saying I couldn't leave because I, uh, and they were going through my camera looking at all these pictures, some of which I shouldn't have taken on the front line uh, with Syria. Um, where they, 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 they said, you know, no, you, you've got to face the music for this. Then this guy turned up, and then one of the soldiers said to me, he said, oh, no, he's coming. He said, no, he, he's bad news. He said, you've got to go. Go now. Just walk away. This is one of the guys who was holding me, because he said, he is really bad. And <laughs> I, I always remember that man. Uh, he just, and he said, they'll shout at you, keep walking. Because I wasn't very far from my hotel. Uh, and he said, it'll take the boss guy a while to realize that you had been arrested to know who you are, that you should be stopped. So they said, well, you know, we'll take our time telling him. But uh, yes, it's, um, it's one of the things I think the, the people also that, that I find myself, in many cases, I would say genuinely the privilege of interviewing who, people who are under the most incredible stress and strain that unlike me, they can't leave after a couple of weeks. They're, they live in it. And 
you see some of the most amazing generosity and politeness and, and care for each other, and even for me, which um, is just remarkable. And it's so inspiring, you know, and I think so many stories which are in difficult, dark places, sometimes they are, they are really inspiring. If, I, if the whole thing to me was a litany of uh, people being killed, shot at, imprisoned, tortured, and nothing ever happened beyond that, I wouldn't be doing the job. It would just be too awful. It's just that so often people uh, manage to get through this. Um, even if they don't, they've done amazing things for other people and, uh, and helped their community. And, you know, we all wonder if we were in this situation somewhere there, they are in, could we possibly measure up to the, to, the, to the way they behaved? And, you know, one can never be sure. Uh, Mike, I'm thrilled to hear that you escaped from from this situation in Lebanon, don't get me wrong, but my immediate next question is, what happened to the photos? What happened? What happened to your photos? I mean, the journalist in me wants oh, to know what happened. Well, to my photo, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, um, the soldier that said I could leave had had my camera, and in it, there was all these pictures, not just of the Prime Minister's house, but of the front line. Did you get them back? Uh, well, just getting to that, he, he'd, he hadn't got to the front line pictures yet, because when this guy arrived, he stopped. And I thought if he saw those, because it was, that was officially forbidden, you weren't allowed to, to take those, um, then I would have been in real trouble. But, but uh, yes, he gave, I was walking past, I put my hand out. It chanced in my arm, really, because they could have said, look, you're lucky enough, I'm letting you go. And he just, towards the camera, and he just put it in my hand. Because otherwise I was worried that I'll get back to the hotel, then they'll see these pictures, and they, they can see what I've got, they'll come in after me. So... I thought, I need the camera back. More, th more for that reason than actually worrying about the camera or the photos. Okay, another question from the uh, live stream. Yes, this is a comment um, from Janet Lee. Um, she would like you to uh, reference the atrocities such as Tigray. She's um, in Ethiopia, uh, which has been under siege for nearly two years, where the internet is cut off Banks are closed and journalism is not allowed, banned by the Ethiopian government. Is this story on your agenda, Mike, and can you shed some light on what's happening? Well, I wish I could shed, shed more light because cause it seems that this person here is... Uh, was it Janet? Janet Lee, yes. yes. Well, Janet, well, Janet seems fairly well informed as it is. Um, I focus primarily at the moment on the Middle East. It's something that's fairly recent, so that uh, I haven't been looking at Tigray, but I have been following the news like everybody else on that and it, it yet it's horrendous the situation there it, it really is and yes the but it, like most um, conflicts of course it's happening on both sides not just to Tigrayans it's happening to some Ethiopian uh, soldiers too and there's all sorts of accusations flying around but uh, deeply grim and there had been hopes for the that the that the new Ethiopian leader was going to be a far more benign character and and he started with much more um, interest in a, in, a, in a free or freer press, freer media, and, uh, and that he'd respect human rights. And sadly, uh, that doesn't seem to have been the case, certainly not in Tigray. Um, but uh, no, I wish I could tell you more, but I, I, I couldn't at the moment. Okay. Um, a question from the Lyrian archival perspective. And the talk uh, focus and all your work has focused on immortalizing the voiceless. How are these uh, records or these uh, videos and materials accessible? And um, are there specific efforts to, or how are they easily accessible? How are they accessible? Well, um, yes, that's, that is a fair, a fair question, Clara. Um, because it's quite difficult with some of the some of the more recent things. Yes, that'll be online. If people searched, it's like the Raka Diaries. You'll find you find those. Just Google those. Um, quite a lot of it will, will be, but all the material, uh, anything over ten years old, is probably it'll be in the BBC archives. But I'm not sure that uh, it'll be accessible online, um, which is a shame uh, because I think. Was, one I said earlier on, things are categorised, they are kept, and fortunately they're not lost, but it's then getting hold of them if you're you know, a member of the public and you want to 
listen or watch something like that. I mean, newspapers, it's a bit easier. So many newspapers will have their archives. You can, you can easily go into those, and I've done that myself. And going back, you know, 100 years <laughs> or more. Uh, but broadcast is trickier. Um, uh, but I think some of the material I've done would be on independent programmes on the BBC's websites. And if you search under my name and that story, it would probably come up. But it's just when things were pre-digital, not much was going online. There wasn't really much online either, uh, not that long ago. So that is, it's not easy. Um, but as anything that anybody desperately wants access to, uh, I, could, I could try and arrange something. So if they came via the university, I could look at uh, providing it for them. Oh, yes. Just to add to that, in the UK, there are some very good archive projects. For example, one run by the Imperial War Museum uh, that is going to um, archive uh, my, uh, an extensive three-hour interview with, with Mike and um, reference uh, the, some of his key interview and key work so that that is going to be preserved. Yes, I mean, if anyone found the presentation here a bit long, the, the Imperial War Museum, they said it's going to be seven interviews, roughly an hour long, which won't be cut. <laughs> so so uh, if you're brave enough for that... Um, do, you know, do you know when that will be available? Um, not as yet, no. Um, it, it's all been... It was supposed to have happened a couple of years ago, and again, the pandemic intervened, and then my work schedules intervened, because I've been asked a couple of times, when can you do this? When can you start the first one? And it's always when I say, give a date, and then I can't do it. It's one of the problems with, uh, with my job that you don't always know what you're going to be doing uh, tomorrow, never mind next week, and you agree to things, then you find you've, you, you can't do it, which doesn't help either with your social life. Is there another question there in the back? Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Joshua Harris, and um, I'm following up on, this, on what Clara and, and uh, your wife had just been speaking of. Um, as I am head of the Media Preservation labs here at the University of Illinois. And I'm going to kind of, first off, tell, um, thank you for your ex extraordinary um, uh, talk today. It was fanta really fantastic. Um, but I would like to kind of use this opportunity to, to highlight exactly what you've just been talking about, which is the difficulty of the life after these objects are broadcast and making sure that they are preserved and that's our job and i work with all the old tapes and all these types of things and we're we're working on a project right now for a british film company that found a collection here at the university of illinois um they're doing a six-part world war ii series on mm -hmm. voices of the human experience using oral history archives and mm -hmm. delving into this stuff and um it's just a uh, hearing your speech really is your talk highlights the importance that of preserving these mm. materials for the long term. And it's a difficult effort, and it's very time consuming and very costly at times. And we can look, luckily here in the US, we do look to our colleagues in, in the UK. The Imperial War Museum is a perfect example of a place that, that, um, that is doing a fantastic job. And uh, we need to make sure that we're out there, kind of, I'm one of those obviously, that's out there making sure that we look to the to make sure that this the material is preserved long that the work that you do has a long life you know into the future and this is these aren't just one time snapshots that were broadcast yes. but that there's so many stories that can be built into the future and so we hope I, to well i hope you get continue to get cooperation because from the bbc um in the uk bbc or itn uh, channel 4 all the other media companies when there's work you want um that they are reasonably free with, with what they're able to supply. Uh, obviously, sometimes you get, uh, not in the BBC's case, but uh, as it's not commercial, but other ones, there's a, a commercial consideration sometimes, and it can stop people getting hold of things, which, as you say, is a real shame, particularly when it's a university like this, it's not a profit-making institution. It's trying to keep these things for the record, for all of us. Uh, and it's a shame if it's denied on commercial grounds um, uh, sometimes there's a copyright issue. Um, it wouldn't be with anything I've done as a staff BBC person, but sometimes there is. Um, but, uh, but it's great to hear you're doing that. 
Really good. Thank you. We have another question from the live stream. <laughs> yes, we do. It's a long one. And it is from, and I apologize if I pronounce this incorrectly, Sakit, Sakit Pahiraju. Uh, can we ever rid the world of these atrocities and the authorities and the structures that enable and benefit from them? Is there an organic way to change that in the very place and with the very people whose, whose communities this happens to. I suppose it has to be through telling the story and trusting the humanity still left in the community to hear and act or to put pressure on those authorities to stop. But do you think there's another way? I don't like and I don't want to be cynical. I guess I'm just curious what your personal view is and what can come out of your work is from the special perspective of your line of work and courage that has helped shape this work. Well, thank you, Sakit. I, I wish there was another way I could think of. I think it is important that we all take ownership of trying to stop such things because uh, not just those in the countries that Sakit mentioned there, you know, the, the variety of countries where it's all happening, but also outside. Because so often people who are immediately affected have so little power because um, without a proper system of government or judicial system, um, no accountability very often, it'd be very difficult for them to, to bring change. Although they, <coughs> ultimately, they, 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 they can, and we've seen that with the, in the Middle East, although sadly much of it was rolled back again, but with the uh, Arab Spring, but there are people that have done amazing things. Uh, and in Zimbabwe, there was a, a, a big uprising, and, and that sadly landed up with not an awful lot different to Robert Mugabe. But, uh, but yes, the people sometimes do take fate in their own hands. Or Iran, we've had two very big uprisings, the Green Revolution uprisings there. Sadly, it didn't succeed in the end, but gave it a really good attempt. I think otherwise all we can do is all make a noise ourselves to, to beat the drum for injustice where we know about it, <coughs> where, we've, where we think something should, really should be done. And hopefully our own politicians can add weight to getting, getting change. Any other questions? <coughs> okay. Clara? Uh, no more? To, shall we conclude? Okay, well, thank you so much, Mike, for this moving and, and memorable uh, presentation. And speaking of archiving, is this not only being live streamed but recorded? And can we get, okay. Are the other Mortensen lectures archived? I'm new here, and I'd certainly like to see the rest of them now that I've been to this one. Okay, oh, great. Well, anyway, thank you. I hope you'll stay for the reception, and um, see you next year. Thank you so much, Melida.